thank you all for joining us for our fifth COVID-19 virtual town hall. It's a really special one today because we are um, co-hosting today's webinar with the European Academy of Dermatology and Venerology, the ADV. But before we begin, my name is Nicole Sudiakal and I'm the Member Services Manager at Global Skin. I'll be moderating today's COVID-19 virtual town hall and the topic is impact of COVID-19 on autoimmune disease and immune suppressed patients with Dr. Bing Tio as our expert. So I'm really happy that we have the chance to connect during this global health crisis. And I really know that we'll learn a lot from the EADV, from Dr. Tio, and of course, um, from our discussions with one another and sharing our experiences. Um, before we begin also, I wanna cover a little bit of the logistics before we start. So today's call or webinar will be about an hour long. Um, and we will also be recording the session for um, people to view on our website in the future. Um, the first 20 minutes, Dr. T will present, um, and then afterwards we'll have about 40 minutes for discussion and for you guys to ask your questions and share your experiences. We'll ask people to um, turn off their videos while the presentation is happening, and we'll also be muting the microphone so that Dr. Tio can present. Um, and then during the presentation, just feel free to um, type out any questions that you have in the chat pod feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will respond to them at the very end. Um, you can also, at the very end, unmute yourself to ask the question yourself if you'd like. So um, that is it from me. Um, I'll now pass it on to our Executive Director, Jennifer Austin, to introduce Dr. Monfrance from the EADB. Thanks, Nicole. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so, so uh, we've worked closely with the EADB in planning this session, and uh, the person that's responsible for helping to make this happen is Dr. Bibi Monfrance. Um, and uh, so I'd like to introduce her. She's going to say a few words about the EADB. Um, so uh, we've, we've been working with BB for quite some time, so we know her well and she knows our organization well. Um, she works at the Aramis Medical Center in Rotterdam. She's the principal educator of trainees who do their five-year training in dermatology. And she's been active with the EADB since 2012 first by co-organizing the yearly Congress in Amsterdam in 2014, and then as a board member. She's currently chair of the Patient Association Working Group, and she's also involved with the Scientific Programming Committee and the EADV School and EADV Advocacy Group. So our organization, Global Skin, has worked closely with BB since 2015 in planning co-hosted sessions focused on patient perspective at each of the annual EADV Congresses. And uh, last year, she was instrumental in creating uh, the first ever position on the Patient Association Working Group for a patient leader, which is actually held by our organization currently. Um, she is a true champion of the patient voice and the need for integrating patients into the work of the EADB. So I'm very pleased and honored to introduce uh, Dr. Bibi Monfrance, uh, uh, who will share with us some information about the EADB and the work that she's doing. Thank you, Bibi. So thank you so much, Jennifer, for your kind introduction. Um, and I brought you two slides, which uh, Nicole will uh, share with you uh, at this moment. Um, and so uh, I'm working in uh, Rotterdam, uh, travel every day from Amsterdam to Rotterdam uh, because it's such a nice place to work here. But I also love working for the EADV, um, for which I have been active uh, since 2012. And my main goal is also to include the patient voice um, uh, and, and give it a more professional uh, place also within our organization because I think that uh, together we can improve the quality of life uh, of the patients with the skin disease. Um, and so Nicole, is it possible for you to share the two slides? Hi, Bibi. Is this the slide? Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, yeah, so that's very good. So this is just uh, the EADV uh, today. So I just summarized uh, what the, this, this organization is, is, is doing. So uh, we organize congresses and symposia. Uh, we have always a yearly congress, which now will be uh, completely virtual due to the, to the circumstances of the COVID pandemia. 
um, we uh, develop and organize educational courses for residents and specialists, but we are thinking really to also involve nurses and maybe also patient leaders in these courses. Um, so that's work for the future. Um, well, we want to support research. We have uh, we have uh, grants that we can uh, provide, and also um, has support uh, work that is doing being done by uh, Global Skin. Um, we provide scholarships and fellowships to better train the dermatologists throughout Europe and the trainees. Uh, and yeah, we, of course, we collaborate with other societies one of which is Global Skin, uh, as also like a, a spokesperson for the for the uh, all the skin uh, organizations that are being active uh, internationally. Um, and then last but not least, we act as advocates for our patients, for you. Uh, and uh, so we, uh, if we ha I have another slide, just the, the second slide. So that's about how many members we have. Um, so, um, uh, so uh, we have about uh, almost eight thousand members, um, and we are active already for uh, around thirty years. And then we have here. Well, I just wrote down our vision and mission, um, uh, and uh, and that's just. In fact, what I just uh, told you about. So um, I'm really hoping that Bing Tio was able to join this meeting. Um, Nicole, do we have any information yet? Yes, Dr. Tio, I, I believe you're here. Yes. Okay, so then I will introduce Dr. Tio. So Dr. Tio is my dear colleague and has been also a principal educator in the Erasmus uh, uh, for many years. Um, and he is an expert in immunology. He knows about inflammatory diseases and also uh, has been uh, uh, dealing with the problems of the, the COVID pandemia and all the patients that use immunosuppressive drugs. So I'm really happy being to have you here tonight and uh, to, to listen to your presentation uh, and then afterwards uh, uh, discuss all the, the questions that uh, the patient leaders might have. Bing. Thank you very much, Bibi. My name is Bing Tio, once again, and uh, I'm working as a dermatologist together with Bibi in Rotterdam. Uh, my favorite topic, winner the dermatology is the immunology. That's why I'm sitting here right now talking to you about the COVID-19. Uh, at the upcoming 20 minutes, we will be dealing with the virus, the immune system, battlefield between the virus and immune system, clinical symptoms in the skin due to COVID-19, and of course, what's happening with your autoimmune diseases if you have COVID and the therapies you're using for your autoimmune disease. Has it an impact on your COVID? Oh, Nicole, how can I? Okay, first I have to disclose myself, as you can see, I'm related to especially the biologic for, uh, pharmaceuticals who are working with biologics in psoriasis and also in atopic dermatitis. Yes. So this is the virus. You all know probably that it's uh, somewhere coming from the bats, somewhere in China, there is domestic animals in markets, wet markets. Uh, then you have this SARS-CoV-2 virus. Is this coronavirus? Why is corona? It looks almost like the corona of the sun. That's why it's called corona. And the most important protein to get entry into the human cells is the S protein, the spike protein. Yes. Where uh, does the virus enter? The nose is the favorite one, but also the oral cavity, the mouth, that's another favorite place to enter a human body. Uh, if you don't have any entering places, no wounds in the skin, it's almost impossible to enter as a virus, as a SARS-CoV-2 virus, into the human body via the skin. Yes.
this SARS-CoV-2 virus and the spike protein does need a receptor on the cells, the target cells, especially the lung cells or your upper respiratory tract cells via this angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, H2 receptor, they enter into the cell, they replicate and they will produce many, many other new viruses. Yes. And this H2 receptor is present also on the tongue. And in, so in the oral cavity on the tongue, you have this H2 receptors. That's why you have a loss of taste or bad tasting in almost 50% of the patients. Uh, also, if the nose is attacked by the virus, you have a loss of smell. And that also occurs in 50% of the patients. So if you have these, please leave your good wines in your cellar and drink it more later in your life. Next, please. So now you have the virus. It enters via the mouth or the nose, goes down into the lungs. Then the battlefield starts between the immune system, as you can see, the skin, uh, also the mucosa of the nose and the mouth. They all are physiological barriers. It's a part of your innate, non-specific immunity, like complements, but also neutrophils, monocytes. These are the hardworking soldiers of your immune system. The adaptive immunity, that's more specific. They can recognize like the S protein, the spike protein of the virus. Those are the real CEOs, the germals of your immune system, the most important ones. And they can produce an immune memory against pathogens. In this case, of course, the virus. Yes. Go next, please. But the virus is not a very passive a virus. They are also acting and battling against this uh, immune system cells. So uh, they replicate in a very speedy manner so that you have a high viral load. But they inhibit almost all the cells that uh, they are uh, attacking all the immune cells, not only the innate immune cells, but also these T cells and B cells, those adaptive immune system. Uh, but the most important one is they try to inhibit an inflammatory protein, that's type 1 interferon, very important if you want to eliminate viruses. They impair that process. Next, please, Nicole. Of all the immune cells, as you uh, can see, the macrophage, the monocyte derived macrophage, are probably the most important inflammatory cell in COVID 19. And they can, uh, yes, the most a prominent director, like the director of the movie, this is the director of your immune attack on the virus. They regulate the immune attack on the virus, but also they are also attacking the blood vessels so that you can uh, see a lot of coagulation disorders, blood clots, so that there is a kind of ischemia, loss of blood flow, especially at the end of your uh, finger, fingertips and of your toes. In that way, you get wounds on your skin. Yes. This is another very uh, complex picture, probably, but there is uh, just only showing you that this macrophage is also capable not only to regulate the immune attack on the virus, but also doing something in this blood clotting. In that way, you also stop the process. Just very simple. If there is a lot of virus in your blood, you need to block the roads. And that's in your blood circulation. And in that way, you block 
the fibers to travel around throughout your body. Yes. This is just uh, showing you that lymphopenia always see this, I mean, a decrease of your number of your white blood cells and it's the lymphocytes we are dealing here. You see that the number is going down. Uh, the B cells, those are the cells who are producing antibodies against the virus. Those are the green stars lower down and you see the more brown dots those are the t-cells in blood it's also going down so you have a lymphopenia at the beginning certainly during the COVID-19 so if you are looking in your blood there is a lymphocytopenia a decrease of the number of lymphocytes but you see also an increase of the virus that is the line of the viral nucleic acid. And there is an increase in inflammatory cytokines and factors like interferons, but also other interleukins like interleukin-6. And you see an increase in D-dimer. That means that there is something going on in blood clotting and blood coagulation. So there is clotting going on, as I showed you earlier, regulated by the monocytes macrophages. Yes, but the target organ, this is the end organ, of course, uh, for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. They will end up in the lungs and they will create a lot of problems, not only due to the virus, but of course, due to the immune attack by the inflammatory cells, as I told you earlier, directed by the macrophages and monocytes. In that way, you will end up with a kind of a fibrotic process, a kind of scarring of the lungs, and that gives you the problem of respiration. Yes, but you see also a lot of skin manifestations of COVID-19. Almost 40 to 50% of the patients showed dermatological uh, diseases you can see that there is something going on in the immune system but also in your blood capillaries in your circulation yes this is a very complex picture also just only telling you of course it's not the skin which is the main organ but the whole body is uh, fighting against this SARS-CoV-2 virus. And what is the most prominent symptom? That's, of course, the fever, dry cough, fatigue, and uh, yes, short of breath, pain in your uh, knee or other uh, very important uh, organs, but also sore throat and I told you earlier, also loss of smell and loss of taste. This is more a closer look that you can see this in the first or two weeks of COVID-19. It's almost like a lupus chill blame. I think uh, the lupus patients know what this is. This was very painful red skin manifestation on your toes, but it also can occur on your fingers. Yes. Uh, the group in Spain, there's a group of the uh, Dermatological Society of Spain with Galvan Casas as the first author. Just summarize what you can see on the skin and they have uh, included 375 patients and the main clinical hospitals are in Madrid and in Barcelona and what they see is this erythema, the redness on the toes and the fingers but also some vesicles or pustules and it's called, I told you, 
earlier also like a lupus chill brain and it's then called pseudo chill brain because it's not a lupus so it's a pseudo chill brain you see this uh, vesicles eruption and also more disseminated throughout your body uh, vesicles it's almost look like an herpes infection or chicken pox sometimes you also see this with carrier lesions like you are like in allergies due to the use of medication yes when do you see this uh, skin lesions it's almost uh, during this fever dry cough shortness of breath that's at the same time, you see that most of the skin lesions you see during these general symptoms. And, and just after, you always also see, of course, these skin lesions, yes. Just showing you the other pictures of this uh, Spanish COVID-19 patients. A lot of redness, more painful, it's not that itchy uh, as in uh, allergic reactions due to medication. This is more kind of a viral exanthema, a skin lesions due to virus infection, in this case, COVID-19. Yes. What's happening there in the skin? This is just only trying to explain that there are many immune cells, especially innate immune cells are involved. Also the mast cells, those are the cells involved in allergies, like in hay fever, uh, it cause a lot of fluid retention in the skin. It's called edema, and also a widening of your blood vessels, and it causes then the redness, that's called vasodilatation, yes. Just remember that if you get COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus infection, it depends of your age, what you can see in the lungs and also in the skin, like especially in children, yes. You can see this uh, Kawasaki, which is an uh, innate immune system disease, especially in children, it can be combined with high fever, atrocious, so pain in your joints, and also redness of the tongue. Yes. This is what's happening in Kawasaki. You get an attack of your immune system on the blood vessels. That's the main thing to know. Yes. So what's happening uh, if you have COVID-19 with your psoriasis? Nothing is happening. It doesn't get better or get worse due to the virus. So they, uh, the group in Northern Italy, yes, next please. Sorry, Nicole. The group in Northern Italy has included all the patients with psoriasis. That's more than 5,000 patients and they uh, look for what's happened during this COVID-19 period in Northern Italy. As you know, this one of the epicenters at the beginning of the COVID-19 story. You see only four hospitalizations, only four psoriasis patients of more than 5,000 are hospitalized and uh, there are no deaths recorded in the psoriasis patients, only four hospitalizations of the total of 5,206 psoriasis patients. Yes. Another question we, uh, which is uh, frequently asked is what's happening with my dupilumab, that's the biologic you use for, Atlantic, uh, for atopic dermatitis. Also in Bergamo, Northern Italy, they looked for this uh, group of patients there is no increased risk for coronavirus disease or the COVID-19. If you're using the Pilimab for your atopic nematitis, 
Yes. Another uh, immune disease, that's the systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE. And they are frequently treated by long-term hydroxychloroquine. That's, of course, a famous medication, uh, as you know, from our president of the United States. He used it during 14 days. These patients has the same symptoms as whether you are using chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, or not. So this are, uh, there are 17 patients they uh, described here in the study, and you see the, the same symptoms is in uh, healthy people with COVID-19. So you don't see any difference whether you have SLE treated with hydroxychloroquine or healthy people with COVID-19. Yes. This is uh, uh, also in the, our blue journal, that's the Journal of American Dermatology, that's showing you all the possible immunosuppressants. So medication you're using to suppress the immune system. And you see, maybe probably the next table is the best table. Can see that the more classical immunosuppressants like corticosteroids, the prednisone, or the cyclosporin, or methotrexate, or mycophenol and moftil, they have a kind of uh, a small risk set here concerning risk. But uh, if you want to do a guideline, our guidelines is telling you now if you have symptoms like fever, cough, or uh, shortness of breath, please stop these medications, these classical, uh, these classic immunosuppressants like the steroids and methotrexate. The new biologics, as you can see, the immunomodulators, especially there's rituximab, it blocks the antibody formation. And, and in that way, a rituximab has uh, the, probably the highest risk of all the biologics you're using for your skin disease. As you know, this rituximab is used for bullous diseases like bullous pemphigoid. Yes. Maybe you can, for the time sake, we can skip this one. Yes. Just uh, showing you that COVID-19, you see a viral response phase your, your innate immune system, the soldiers, the monocytes, neutrophils are working hard to eliminate at the first phase during your infection, during your viral infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. At the end, you have this hyperinflammation or the cardiac cytokine storm. So at the beginning, you need really the immune system to kill the virus. But at the end, you are suffering of your immune cells. They are working too hard. And in that way, they cause a lot of damage. You don't need to. So that's it's called the cytokine storm or hyperinflammation. Yes. What about what? What are the, uh, of course, you need uh, to develop vaccinations. That's the best thing to do. But if you have COVID-19, then maybe you can use the antibodies of a patient who was already infected and you're using this neutralizing antibodies with a lot of effects, as you can see here. Next. But also, as you see, you can block the virus with this uh, protein blockers like lentil CD4, or at the end, with using anti-interleukin-6, that's biologics used in rheumatoid arthritis, tocilizumab and saradumab, or anti-interleukin-17, you can block the problems you get from the COVID-19. So at the end, during this hyperinflammation phase, the cytokine storm, the use of immunosuppressants is probably much better than not using these immunosuppressants. Yes. And now we have the other problems. That's what the lung doctors told me earlier. 
thing we have is now, of course, you have during the infection, this first wave problem, second wave problem, but at the end, you have this psychic trauma, burnout, mental illnesses, and also very chronic respiratory problems. And for the elderly, you have this, a lot of other problems, psychosocial, but also the lung problems. So please take care of these long-term problems, not only the short-term, I discussed this, but also the long-term, they are coming now. Okay. I'll, uh, so what I discussed at this moment, first the virus, immune system, trying to eliminate, and at the end, we are overactive, this innate immune system, and uh, in that way, you can better use immunosuppressants during the cytokine storm. What's happening with skin diseases? Almost nothing. If you have a treatment uh, for your skin disease with uh, classic or more biologics, you always can continue uh, with this medication. Uh, and finally, please take care. It's not only when you uh, have eliminated the infection, then it's uh, uh, all over. No, please take care of these patients more in a chronic way, on a long-term way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. BB, uh, the EADV invitation, but also uh, you, Jennifer, and Nico, thank you very much for your assistance of this process of this webinar. And of course, the audience. Big thanks to the audience. Thank you for listening to me. Well, it's been our honor to have you, Bing, and BB uh, as part of this uh, co-hosted webinar with the EADV. It's so wonderful to see such active discussion um, around such an uncertain situation. I think it gives us all strength to be here together virtually and to have wonderful caring experts join us and to help bring us insights that our patients um, you know need so very much so thank you so much bing and bb we appreciate your time uh, uh coming uh together today uh thanks to all of our members for being here and again thank you to uh bb and bing and the eadv take care everyone take care of your patients